Um, so I'm Jamie Burt, I'm the Chair of PAVO. Um, I'm delighted to be hosting this, this second expert session of our PAVO Conference and AGM Week, Caring for Carers. Um, COVID-19 has brought into sharp relief um, the challenges in the social care sector to all of us, I think. Um, but challenges are certainly nothing new in the sector. Um, I look forward to delving into this in more detail in the session. Um, but we'll hand over now to my fellow PAVO board trustee, Wendy Bevan, who shall introduce our speaker, Baroness Jill Pitt-Keefley, joining us from the House of Lords this morning. Wendy, over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, the board and trustees of PAVO were absolutely thrilled and privileged that Baroness Pitt-Keefley was able to join us. Thanks to the vagaries of, of um, the Wi-Fi, we've, we've all managed it this morning, so uh, long may it continue. But we're, we're very pleased that um, Jill was able to join us because she is so knowledgeable about the whole subject of carers and care in the community and has a long and illustrious career, both in Parliament and in her, her, her original job as a, a social worker in the inner cities, which obviously taught her huge amount of um, the problems associated with caring for loved ones and the support that needs to be on offer. She was, of course, the original chair and founder of the organization which actually became Carers UK. And, um, it was for her work with, with caring and support that she was awarded her baronessy. She's also extremely knowledgeable about the particular issues that concern rural areas because, of course, she lives just over the border in Herefordshire. And um, we do have unique problems. So I think... The best thing I can do now is to ask Baroness Pitt Keithley of Cabersham, OBE, and lifelong campaigner, to continue with our expert session for Parvo. And I hand over to you, Jill. You're just on mute, Jill. I mean, honestly, I knew I'd do that. I forget to unmute myself. I think the the words we've all learned during the pandemic uh, are, you're muted, isn't it? And I must say, it is a great pleasure to uh, to join you. But um, one of the one of the the things that come out of the the, uh, the pandemic, I think, is opportunities to do things like this. Um, because my parliamentary schedule, I have a very heavy three-line whip today, wouldn't have allowed me to come and join you in person. But uh, through through technology, we, we can join and discuss these very important problems together. And I must say, I have to take my hat off to the House of Lords, not an institution known for embracing change very easily, uh, but it did actually embrace the whole issue of technology and hybrid working very early on uh, in the pandemic. <clears throat> I think we're all at the stage of recovery from the pandemic, recognise it's not yet behind us. And I think we all know some of the things that we've learned during the pandemic when it comes to thinking about social care. Because while the crisis in acute care was dealt with relatively successfully at the beginning of the pandemic, it was followed by a devastating crisis in adult social care. Older people and working age disabled people with care disease were left particularly vulnerable. And we all know about the issue of charging people who were not tested back to care homes, where sadly uh, deaths were very frequent. I think we all know too about the problems which pre-existed in the social care system, because most of us have been banging on about them for years. The lack of integration between health and social care, successive governments prioritising the NHS, 
and neglecting to fund social care adequately. Ministers have direct responsibility for NHS, while responsibility for social care rests with local authorities. These problems are far from new. Many inquiries, including parliamentary inquiries, have focused on the need to fund care properly and to put more focus on prevention and addressing the poor integration between health and care services. What the COVID crisis did was highlight the effects of these long-standing problems. And as age concerned it, laid bare the stark inequalities of the current social care system and revealed the true extent of the impact that underfunding, structural issues, and the market instability have had on the system's ability to respond and protect people at a time of crisis. And of all the people who were most disadvantaged by um, the pandemic, we have, of course, to look at family carers. Now, <clears throat> I'm old enough to remember <coughs> when the word carer was not in the dictionary. <clears throat> I, I don't suppose any of you are as old as I am and remember that, but there was no such word as carer. And occasionally it was misspelled as career. In fact, more often it was misspelled as care. Now we have carers everywhere, but very often we talk about carers as the paid carers, those, or indeed NHS staff or staff in, in, in social care situations who are called carers. But what I want to address this morning is what I call my carers, the uh, millions and millions of people, and I'll talk about figures in a minute, who provide care unpaid if they're lucky, they may get some allowance, but they are the unpaid family carers. Um, <clears throat> and they were particularly disadvantaged by the pandemic. And the time at which they were particularly disadvantaged is very, very significant. Because, of course, we're in the midst of proposals for reform of social care, long awaited, and I'll, I'll come to those uh, in a minute try to which will try to address some of the problems and as yet i remain to be convinced that these reforms are going to do very much for the family carers but there's no doubt that the pandemic had a monumental uh, impact on unpaid carers lives not only because of the increased amount of care that many were having to provide but because of the far-reaching effect um, that this level of care is having on many aspects of their lives their relationships, their mental and physical health, their paid work and finances, and of course their emotional well-being. And here I want to quote from Carers UK State of Caring 2021, uh, which has some very interesting figures. Because Carers UK estimated that overnight at the start of the pandemic, an additional four and a half million people became unpaid carers meaning that one in four UK adults were giving unpaid care to an older, disabled or ill relative or friend at the height of the pandemic. Um, those numbers may decrease slightly, but the numbers of unpaid carers have risen significantly as the population ages and healthcare continues to improve. Um, so now increasing support for carers must be at the heart of how we rest the recovery from the, uh, the pandemic. Um, I think you will all be familiar with the figure of six million carers um, that we've we've used many years as, as an estimate of the unpaid carers. And most of those figures come from the censuses. I don't know even if you should say censuses or CSI, uh, which have been taken uh, over the years. And we campaigned in the early years to get a question about caring in the census. And it's that which has provided us uh, with, with these uh, the excellent figures. Um, but an extra four and a half million on top of the six million brings us to nearly 11 million carers. Uh, and the figures may decrease slightly as services back begin to be resumed. But we all know that some of the care of the services and many of those provided the voluntary sector with which we'll, we'll all be familiar have never actually been reactivated. Day centres have closed, visiting services have, have stopped and all, all around we have pressure on services. Of course, 
what is going to happen if you have pressure on services is that they're going to put more attention on those who are alone, who don't have a carer. In fact, some of you may have followed the Secretary of State for Health at his Conservative Party conference speech, in which he said families must look first. Uh, must look to themselves first for care, as though families don't already look to themselves first for care. That's why there are nearly ever million carers. And of course, if you put financial figures onto this, the, the numbers are staggering. Um, we reckon that carers, the care given unpaid was valued at 530 million per day during the pandemic, or 193 billion in a full year. And last night I watched the Balls program on, uh, on care, and I noticed he was still using the old figure of 192 million. But let's be clear, we're working on now 193 million a year, far stripping the value of the, of the NHS. But of course, this comes with very high personal costs, that care. It may be given free with love and duty, but it comes with very high personal costs. Many carers find that their relationships are impacted. Uh, they try to balance paid work with caring, and they're facing their own health problems, as many, as many of you know, as a result of their caring role. Um, in addition to the financial cost of caring, with 31% of the, the respondents to the state of caring survey said that they were struggling to make ends meet. And over two thirds reported that they regularly use their own income or their savings to pay for care or support services, equipment or product for the person they care for. So the average carer looking after somebody outside of resident care faces a financial penalty of over 114 pounds a month. And we think of the level of the carer's allowance, um, you know, well, I'll leave you to draw your own, uh, uh, your, your own uh, conclusions on that. Now, we often think about caring as being part and parcel of a woman's life, and women are still most likely to be providing care and most likely to be providing more hours of care. Uh, they make up to over half of all carers. And 20% of all women between the ages of 45 and 54 are providing unpaid care for someone with a disability or illness. And of course, some of those people, quite a lot of them actually, are providing care for more than one person. Perhaps a child with disabilities, a child with learning difficulties, an aging, uh, an aging parent. Um, now, one of the things that Carers UK has always campaigned for is the ability of women to stay in work, and men for that matter, stay in work as long as possible uh, in, in order to enable them to combine paid work with caring. This has all sorts of effects. It enables them to continue with their pension and it stops building up poverty for themselves in the future, as well as, of course, being very beneficial in psychological terms for enabling them to keep um, uh, uh, on with a, with a paid, paid job. And Carers UK has had some success with employers, getting them to recognise uh, that they have carers uh, in their uh, in their, their workforce, and therefore should try to give them carers leave, and, and so on. And we've tried very hard to get carer leave made statutory. We haven't done that yet. We're still working on it, but it is uh, certainly uh, in legislation a voluntary leave. So that's a very very important part of it. Um, perhaps I'll leave discussion about uh, carers' physical health uh, to any questions that you might have. But one of the things I really want to highlight is how worried carers are about their future. When asked about services, six in ten of the carers said, and there were well over 8,000 surveyed, said they were uncertain about what practical support they might be able to access during the next 12 months. And 62% said they were worried that services would be reduced. So many carers are desperately worried that they won't be able to get back to even the level of support they were having before the pandemic. 
Now, the government is committed to social care reform, including taking steps to ensure that carers have their support and advice and respite that they need, fulfilling the goals of the Care Act, with which you probably are familiar. The Welsh, Scottish and Northern Ireland governments have also committed to reform. The Scottish government, for example, committed to the establishment of a national care service. <coughs> to build a society that recognises values and support carers, and to create a system that works, carers' voices, opinions and experiences must be heard, listened and acted on. <coughs> form a key part of the forthcoming white paper on social care report reform. It is of paramount importance to all of us who care about carers. I, I try to be as optimistic as I can, but I tell you it is hard. Building back better hardly mentions carers. I've also already quoted to you what the Secretary of State said in conference speech, as though families aren't already the first port of call uh, for support. Fixing social care, and this government and others before it have said they will fix social care. It requires two things, above all, enough money and better integration. The, for, the Institute for Fiscal Studies quoted my noble friend Lord Eachwell in saying, it's clear, this is funding that is proposed, it is clear that the extra funding will not be sufficient to reverse the cuts in the number of receiving care seen during the 2010s. And also points out that many people with care needs not considered severe enough will continue to miss out. And you all know the scenario where you have to be right at the top of the list in order to qualify uh, to have your care needs met. And one of the things that maybe stops you qualifying is having an unpaid carer at home. So the proposals um, to raise money from national insurance, um, I think there's universal agreement that they will, the money will not be enough to cover the needs of this in social care. Um, and in any case, none of the money raised is going to social care until for at least two years. And listen to the uh, chief executive of the NHS this morning talking about waiting lists and the money, as you know, from raised from national insurance is going to the NHS to help the clear waiting list. She was not at all hopeful that waiting list could be cleared in two years. So my worry is that not a penny of money raised to fix social care is going to go in to the front line of social care. And as a consequence, how much of that money is going to support unpaid carers? Um, as far as, so that's, that's my pessimism, my, my worry about the proposals and as far as finance is concerned and as far as integration is concerned, this is an absolutely vital need. There's always been political agreement about this. I've been working on this for, I don't know how long, <laughs> I reckon the other day that I published my first book discharge from hospital 50 years ago and believe me I was saying the same things then that I'm saying now that there's no integration between health and social care or community care as we called it in those days a time when waiting lists at the NHS are growing longer by the minute should it not be a priority to ensure that no one stays in hospital longer they have to by having discharge procedures which provide a seamless transition and making sure that the all in, uh, it all too frequent readmission because of inadequate cooperation between the NHS and local authorities is guarded against. We hear that care jobs are unfulfilled and requests for care are being turned down because of staff shortages. 
Local authorities struggle to recruit enough workers to meet increasing demands. No wonder when you can earn more money filling shelves at Sainsbury's. The minute someone is point, uh, admitted to hospital, plans should be being made between health services, social care and the voluntary sector about what is going to happen on discharge. But sadly, you will be too familiar with the usual pattern of the Friday afternoon discharge where the hospital is desperate to en empty its wards and social care has been inadequately prepared or even informed that a discharge is imminent. The government plans should include such commitment to planning and cooperation. Thus far, they do not. However, we are waiting a white paper on social care. I must watch my time and not talk too long. Um, we, we are waiting this, uh, this white paper on social care. We have been awaiting it for several years, but we are now promised that it will come before Christmas. Which Chris is perhaps still, sorry, I, uh, <clears throat> it, I'm sure that we'll see it um, be, before Christmas. And we do have to ensure um, that, that its proposals are adequate for social care. And considering the government's current proposal about levelling up and commitment to levelling up, <clears throat> social care could be at the heart of a levelling up agenda if we had the vision for its workforce and for the impact it has on the health of a community in its broadest sense. Care providers can be encouraged to diversify businesses to reach out creative into a community by providing tax incentives, for example. And if we want a high skill, high wage economy, which the Chancellor says we have, we, we do, what better place to start than so care with its huge workforce, badly paid at the moment, but certainly not unskilled. Surely we can look to that workforce to, to develop and, and deliver some of the things the Chancellor wants. The skills could be developed by providing training and retention, could be dealt with better career progression and recognition of qualifications. And as carers, and I'll finish here because I didn't speak too long, if you provide more support to unpaid carers, you get very best out of that huge, though unrecognised workforce. And if you help them combine paid work with caring responsibilities, you not only help them financially, but save them from poverty in the future. Surely this makes good economic as well as moral good sense. And it's on that note that I'll close, hoping that you agree with me that that makes moral good sense, but also economic good sense. And I'll open for questions. And I think, uh, I think Jamie, are you going to illustrate the questions? Yep, certainly, Jill. Um, thank you. Um, all very interesting. Um, it, it's sort of seared into my memory that um, in his first speech as um, Prime Minister, Boris did say that he was going to solve the crisis in social care once and for all. But um, I won't labour that point too much. <laughs> um, but yes, floor is open to everyone um, for questions. Um, please do use the uh, raise your hand facility at the bottom of the screen. Um, so yes. Any questions? Anybody want to kick off? Um, Claire Swales, coming to you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, absolutely fascinating insight. And I've got to say, uh, much of what you have said this morning resonates with the picture we see here in Powys. I haven't really got a question. I just wanted to, to highlight really the great work that third sector carers organisations such as Credi that are on the call today are doing in Paris in terms of supporting uh, unpaid carers and the work they do to highlight the needs of unpaid carers across Paris. We know that in Paris we are facing, like many other areas, a real care crisis uh, and very much agree with what you said around the recruitment crisis in terms of domiciliary care where people can be paid more. Uh, working in supermarkets for example without perhaps the stress uh, in terms of providing care 
Um, it is a really difficult picture out there, uh, but just wanted to highlight the great work that the third sector does. I was a county councillor many moons ago, and we were sat in the chamber having conversations about uh, the local authority and the health board working more closely to provide care and support. Yet here we are probably, oh gosh, 12, 13, 14 years later, and we're no further on. And that's a real shame. And it's to the detriment of people in our communities. Maybe one day we'll, well see it. Uh, we can only keep pushing. But as I said, a huge, huge I, thanks to the like of credit carers and I other organisations. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Claire. <clears throat> and of course, in the pandemic, so often it was third sector voluntary organisation that step up to the plate, that organise um, food deliveries <clears throat> are much more innovative than you know, and that's one of the great virtues of the voluntary sector, isn't it? It's ability to innovate and not have to go through many processes as, as local authorities and, and the NHS do. Uh, one of the things that I, I think gets in the way of recognising this is the reluctance to share data between um, between the organisation. And, I, you know, I, the particularly God knows the health service is reluctant to share data with local authorities in many areas, never mind with the voluntary sector itself. But of course, in some of those rules were broken, or at least heavily bent during the pandemic. And surely we can remember that and be reminded of it. You know, not, the world didn't fall in, did it? On most, most of the time, people got better care. Uh, through through us Ben or breaking those rules, and I do hope that we can uh, we we can do them. I, I I'm not. I have a question in the House of Lords next week actually about <clears throat> voluntary sector organisations because I do feel that they're sufficiently recognised at national level. And one of my question is actually that the minister for the voluntary sector, which is now, who is now appointed, um, we until the last shuffle have a single minister for the voluntary sector. Um, or for, for civic society. Now the minister has four other folios as well as that of the voluntary sector. And a question will be to the minister about how does uh, he propose that this support that is so badly needed uh, will, will be uh, provided. But I think that's absolutely right. But to your, your further point about no cooperation between local authorities and health service you know we all go back years i go back even far longer than you and the problem in the same but it originates in 1948 i'm sorry about that but it does because in 1948 the nhs was set up men died when they were 66 one year after retirement and women died about 68 you know, I've had, a, I've got an aunt who's just had her 104 first birthday, and that's fantastic, you know, but yeah. it, it provide, put a strain on the system, which was never set up to deal with the social care aspects that we have now. And that is why it's, I think, proving so difficult and not to crack. But thank you for your question anyway. Yeah, and you're absolutely right on that information sharing during uh, COVID. We overcome that. And as I said, we've got Credi here, we've got Grace and Wells Forum, we've got Accessibility Powers, all working and, and shifting and changing the way they were delivering to make that difference to individuals. And across all the sectors, yeah. we're here to make that difference to individuals' lives and make their lives better. We just need to remove those barriers, don't we, really? So I will leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. And uh, I certainly look forward to hearing this response that your question in the chamber gets, um, Jill, and I'm <laughs> pleased to hear you flying the flag for the voluntary sector. Um, Credi Carers, sorry, I don't, we've already got your name as that, but yes, please, oh. um, if you'd like to introduce yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, so um, I'm Marie Davis, and I'm working uh, with Credi to um, on the Creative Respite project. And it was a, a thank you so much, um, first of all, for, for Pavo for highlighting carers on, on your AGM agenda and um, for the talk and the information you've given to really highlight what's happening at the, the UK level and you know how much during the pandemic 
they are more carers caring more. Um, and I just wanted to to just highlight again some thank you, Claire, for, for acknowledging um, what's happening with, with Credi. But really, um, I would say that in Powers particularly, I, I have seen how things are moving on. Um, tomorrow will be 18 years for me working with the, the carer support in, in Powys. I've seen a massive change for the Social Services and Wellbeing Act. And just wanted to highlight things that have changed with brilliant partnership working of the Carer Steering Group and the Regional Partnership Board. Care has been involved more than ever. And uh, another thing to highlight is uh, the carers getting information from the local authority around day centres and services and a group of very active carers coming up with own solutions, engaging community and um, what has ha what has started happening over the last four weeks in Astrid Gunlice mm -hmm. is a Thursday club with people doing it, uh, supporting each other and with, with support of the voluntary services, with support from mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. um, other organisations mm -hmm. like Dementia Matters mm -hmm. and Accessibility Powers, really working in, in partnership for solutions that make a real difference. I completely agree about getting it more grassroots, getting the support there, but enabling mm -hmm. people to contribute and not just being a passive recipient of service. That's what people really want. And it makes I, such I, a massive difference. I think Thank you so much. You highlight one of the things that's very, very important to me. <clears throat> Always been. <clears throat> I'm sorry, a bad throat. Um, about the carers' movement. It is the voice of carers themselves, which is the driving force. Always have been. Uh, carers UK, as you know, has always been controlled by carers on board. That was a very, very important founding principle uh, when we set the uh, the org organization up um and it isn't just that that is how you find out what's really going on it is also because it's what's the most powerful thing uh, and i've seen you know i work nowadays at, at a national, national level but i've seen ministers I've seen the scales fall from their eyes, almost literally, when they're confronted by a group of carers. You know, they hadn't quite realised what it was like. And I, a, a minister who, who I, I won't name, um, but the last care rights day, but one I think it was, um, it's a big gathering in Parliament and Carers UK and a lot of other organisations had, had organised for carers uh, to, uh, to come. And the Minister from the Lords went round and spoke to the, the, the carers and, and you know, he was very, very impressed and so on. And the next day I had a meeting with him because I wanted to follow it up while it was fresh in his mind. And he said to me, you know, I only just realised that for those carers to be there, you had to organise someone to substitute for them. I said, that's right, Mister. He couldn't be there unless someone else took over the role. And I thought, how is it that you didn't understand that? How is it that you spoke all those carers and hadn't realised that they were not free to come to Westminster unless some substitute can be arranged? You know, and so it is it is the voice carers themselves. That's why right in the very early days for doing all the media stuff, and I always made it a rule, my colleagues uh, always followed it up, that it's that the media don't want to hear from me or from my mother or, or from Helen. It's a follow-up. They want to hear, first of all, from what it's like from the carer's point of view. And that's why I'm enormously indebted to the thousands of carers who've been prepared to be filmed, to speak on the radio and so on, to tell what it's actually like, because that's where the voice is most powerful and where it has most effect. You're absolutely right. Thanks, Bev. Uh, Wendy, coming to you for your question. <laughs> Number to unmute. <laughs> Yeah, mine's not really a question either, but it is another angle because I was doing a talk yesterday and a gentleman who is now retired, who was um, 
in charge of the spinal injuries unit at Gabowin, Agnes Hunt. And he emphasized the need to address the needs of carers for the recuperation of the patient because he said the carers and the home situation is so vital to the mental health and and the general ambience of recovery and he could not stress highly enough the need for support and um, emotional consideration that the whole package needs it's not just the patients it's not just the paid carers it's the home carers because absolutely, they're the ones that are there doing it 24 7. one of the things <clears throat> that, that i often say about the emotional issues is caring takes place within a relationship <laughs> you know it, the, in that sense, it's quite different from the paid care that comes in as a result of your need. If you weren't in a relationship with that person, you wouldn't become their carer. And the quality and the history of that previous relationship, of course, affects how the caring goes. If you've always had a really difficult relationship with your mother and she's always been tricky, she's not going to become a sweet and great old lady just because she now has mobility difficulties and as a consequence all of that stuff all of that emotional stuff is of tremendous importance and i think that is why carers groups um, that marie mentioned and getting support each other has always been so important because to, to go to safe place where you can actually say to somebody else God, my mother's being difficult today and I wanted to hit her and of course that's a perfectly normal thing to feel uh, it, at times when you're under stress uh, you know is so supportive and so important uh, for people uh, in that 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 role but when I was uh, talking about uh, about the voice of carers being being strong I, I'm often I I then think to myself well you know somebody's in a 24 7 caring relationship how on earth have they got the energy to go to a carers group meeting or attend one on zoom or or anything like that i i think that's how the carers movement has worked worked out itself they've you, when you can you do it for other carers and there'll be other times we're too stressed and unable to do it um and then that i think people who've perhaps lost a loved one uh, and perhaps found that that all very difficult um you know the post caring this is so the purpose of your life has gone out um will actually uh, those people will actually be of extreme uh, importance and support to other carers who who are in a current situation um but i think wendy and and uh, the person who spoke to us absolutely right that whole emotional package has got to be considered and you know it'll vary it'll vary some people and and people make assessments you know when when the carer's assessment is done of course we're increasingly hearing that the carer's assessment is not being done by local authorities for all it's enshrined in law um I, it, you know those emotional issues have to be taken uh, into account as well i think I, d I do want to um, say there's not an immediate question. Can I just say something more about white paper and and legislation, Jamie? Is that a, is that all right? We yes, yes. we are please, please expecting the white paper. I do hope you will all wait for it, examine it, um, say what you like about it, say what you don't like about it um with local mps and the health and social care <coughs> bill which makes all the changes sets up all new um uh, crisis of intermediate uh, centers and so on and moves on from the lansley report that bill has now almost finished its message in the house of commons 
um, and it come to the Lords, we expect to have second reading before Christmas. And the committee stage um, will take place in the early of next year. Now, if I can just bang the House of Lords drum for a minute, what we do in the House of Lords is take a piece of legislation which has very often not been looked at or not been thoroughly examined in the Commons, and we go through it line by line by line, and we put down amendments. We don't usually vote on amendments at this stage, but the, we try to put pressure on the, on the minister, and then report stage, we'll bring it back. Now, there will be some amendments which are going to be of huge significance to care. One of those will be about assessments, another will be a hospital discharge, and I'm not quite sure what it'll be, but I do urge you to keep in touch with your local networks and to, to make your opinions known on what those amendments are. Because if the Lord passes amendments, and we probably will, because you know lots of people are very uh, pro carers uh, and the voluntary sector in the House of Lords, they then go back to the House of Commons for what's known as ping pong. And it's at that point that you have to put pressure on your MPs to accept the Lord's amendments if they are for the benefit of carers. So I, I urge you, and I know it's a lot to ask when everybody's so busy and they, you know, you've got, but I do urge you to try to get your groups to follow with great attention the progress of this bill as it proceeds uh, through the House of Lords. Um, sticking on legislation, Jill, um, the Assisted Dying Bill has had an awful lot of press um, recently. Um, it passed unopposed um, in its second reading in the House of Lords, um, but there doesn't seem to be an appetite for it in the Commons Chamber, um, as far as I can see. Um, I think in the public's view, it has an awful lot of support. Um, we could talk all day about um, using statistics, but um, I, I do genuinely believe that it has public support. Um, so I was wondering why you thought that it, that, that appetite isn't there in the well, Commons I Chamber think for it. It's, assisted dying is an extremely complex issue. And complex issues <laughs> don't take easily to legislation. It's very difficult in legislation to mark nuances and so on. And I have to say, I myself am undecided about it. I didn't take part in the debate in the House of Lords. And had it gone to a vote, I honestly don't know which way I would have voted. I have had two friends who've gone to Dignitas to die. And for one of them, I felt it was absolutely the right decision. And for the other, I don't think she should ever have been accepted because she was actually not terminally ill and she was suffering from a severe depression. And I thought it was not right, morally not right, that she should be accepted at Dignitas and pay, a, I may say, a vast amount of money um, to, to end, end her own life. So I think a very complex issue. It's a very, very difficult issue as far as carers are concerned and that whole thing about people with disabilities feeling guilt um, about the, the the amount of care that they're receiving and so on um, I I think it's too complex an issue really for them to be for there to be a concerted view across the commons and it's going I mean the House of Lords didn't vote for it it, it just didn't vote it so it's allowed the bill to go into committee, which allows a lot more discussion and a lot more teasing out. But I, I don't think there's any chance, really, of this time, of the bill becoming law. Thanks, Jill. Uh, Marie Credit Carries, coming back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for again, giving us a, an idea of what, what's happening in the Lords and the House of Commons and, and 
papers and <laughs> things like that, things that I should learn more about. But I was just wondering, um, those things <clears throat> happening on the UK level, how will they impact on carers in Wales yeah. and in Paris? Some of that will depend on the local authority, of course, and what the, the, the uh, decisions are. But for example, um, the new legislation which will put money on national insurance and which will come into force on the 1st of April is not a devolved answer. That, that, that of course, the finance is, is not involved. And so the amount of money uh, will be available to health and social care in Wales uh, will be determined UK-wide and then presumably on the Barnet uh, formula. Um, but remember that the money is going first to the NHS before it comes anywhere near social care. The money raised from national insurance is going first to the NHS before it's anywhere near the front line of, of social care. And that will apply UK wide. Uh, now, we all understand about the political significance of the NHS. And no government is going to want to go into an election three years' time with waiting lists as high as they are in the NHS now. Politically, that will be impossible. And so you that's why my that's my hesitation about being hopeful about the money going into so care although it's intended to fix social care you have to think of the political reality and i we don't like it i don't like it the nhs is much much more politically politically sexy if you like for a government than anything to do with social care the main responsibility is with local authorities and you hear ministers all the time say well money has been provided to the local authorities and it's up to them how they spend it and i'm sorry if if that is a political clinical view but i'm afraid it is reality Yes, a, a sad reality there, really, but um, a, a, a real one. You know, um, most people, that we, it's our business, it's in our bones, social care. But for most people, it doesn't strike them until somebody in their family needs it. They don't ever think about it. And when they do, if I had a pound for everybody who'd said to me over the years, but my mother's paid her taxes all her life. Why has she got to pay for social care now? It, I'd, I'd be a millionaire because people do not understand the difference in the funding or the difference in the imperative. They, they really don't. The NHS is, as somebody said, the nearest thing this country has to a, a, a religion. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, all, I'm, a, I'm a great devotee of, that, of the NHS. I owe my life to it, literally owe my life to it. So I'm not knocking the NHS. I'm just telling you what the political reality is. Thanks, Jill. Um, any further questions from anyone? I, I, I don't, I, I'm sorry I have been pessimistic. I don't, I don't mean to be pessimistic. I mean to point out the reality. Because what you're all doing at local level and in your personal lives is what really makes everything, it, it, what's what makes the system tick. Carers are what make the system tick. If all the carers gave up, where are we going to find another, whatever I said it was, 9393 billion pounds a year? You know, the fact is they're not going to give up, are they? So we don't have that ultimate political weapon of saying we're going to down tools because actually we're not. And we, we must celebrate that because it's about love and duty and, and the care that we have for each other as families. And we should that's to be celebrated. But we also have to, if we're going to get changes in a system which is reluctant to change, we do have to exert as much of that political muscle as we can. 
I think that's that's really important. And there is this opportunity coming up with the new legislation um, and th with the white paper. Finally, no, I'm not going to say finally, but I don't, you know, in my wildest dreams, I don't expect every, any government to allocate to social care the money that it really needs. I, you know, the money just isn't there for that. But all I want is for social care and carers not to be seen as the poor relation, the Cinderella in funding systems. And that's how they always are. And I will, as long as I can, and as long as all of you can, we have to go on fighting to make sure that isn't the case. Thanks, Jill. On that, I'm going to do a quick plug for the um, Third Sector Partnership Council, um, which is part of the Third Sector Scheme in Wales, um, which is unique in the UK, um, and it legislates that um, the Third Sector has to have that engagement with Welsh Government, um, and, and it is a key mechanism for lobbying and um, just having that conversation and comment uh, from the sector. Um, I will add a link um, to a bit more information about I, that I... into the chat. I think that's absolutely um, right. And, and Jamie, Sorry, the, the, the really important thing about that is that it isn't an optional extra. You know, it's not have regard to, it's not shall take into account. It's actually they have to be there at the table when decisions are made. And that's absolutely key, um, really important. Yes, as I say, it's, it's a great mechanism for us to be part of that conversation and the sector to have its voice heard um, in Wales. So um, um, good to raise awareness of that. Um, I also want to plug, um, I'm on no sort of commission or sponsorship here, but um, I'm going to do a quick plug for the Ed Balls programme. Um, I, I think it's called um, Inside the Care Crisis. Um, I only managed to watch the first episode so far, um, but it, I find it fascinating. Um, and I think that it's really going to bring the conversation around the care sector into the public opinion yes. a bit more. The, the second um, so program I last night, and they that. are now available on iPlayer. But one of the most interesting things, um, I don't know, oh, you haven't seen the second episode, but Ed Balls um, says he will discuss with his wife Yvette, uh, who, who is a, min uh, a shadow minister, as you know, um, what their future care needs will be. Because as we all ought to be planning with our families, how our care is going to be provided in the future. And she absolutely refuses to discuss it because she doesn't know what the situation will be. She doesn't know what the needs will be and so on. And of course, it is only one in six of us who ever in it whoever incurs those really huge care costs, um, which we, uh, the, the legislation will put a cap on at 86 or whatever, 86,000. But remember, the cap is only on the care costs. Your hotel costs in their homes, will you'll still have to pay for. Um, but even they do not want to discuss the future. And I think that's the big problem we have. All of us put our heads in the sand about that. I'm, I'm the same. It's my business. And I still don't want to discuss with my husband or my children what my care needs will be. So I'm may help her as well. <laughs> I think that conversation has touched all of our lives, I think, um, in different ways. Um, I, I've just launched the poll. If you could all um, complete that, that would be great. Um, uh, otherwise, any closing comments? At well, all, I think I've, uh, I've spoken enough I've, I've my, my, my closing comments, but uh, I suppose go on, go on fighting, go on making the voice is, is my only closing comment, really. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. Really appreciate it. Very informative um, session. Um, thank well. you. Um, I hope that everyone listening um, will attend some more of our events for the conference this week. Um, and thank you all for your thank time. You. Nice to see you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye now.